Yeah, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a teacher turned founder of a uh, ed tech company now called Fan School. And our mission is to uh, take what we've done with fantasy geopolitics, which started in my classroom, and uh, continue uh, turning students into fans of learning. So okay. uh, we're, we're putting together a uh, fantasy sports-like platform, uh, a lot like fantasy geopolitics, using data that actually matters. And uh, we're gonna <laughs> we're, we're gonna uh, take what we've what we've done with fantasy geopolitics and, and sort of come up with a, a couple other verticals. Uh, next next fall will be uh, politics for the election. We'll have sort of a, rather than drafting countries, we'll have states, and then uh, using this in any content area. So um, I'm working on that full time now. Great. So how long were you in the classroom before? Yeah, so six years. I was in the classroom yeah. this time last year, and um, after I got my master's degree and uh, certified in education in Minnesota, started teaching right away and um, was at a charter school that whole time. Could you explain what fantasy geopolitics is? For sure, yeah. So it's like fantasy football for countries and world news. Um, and it all started, you know, kind of I was looking for a way in my classroom to sort of get students uh, reading more news and becoming more aware of what was happening in the world. And, and literally while I was sort of, sort of frustrated lesson planning, um, looking for a way to do this, I, I checked my fantasy football team and, and you know, got distracted for an hour. Uh, and I realized I was researching and, and learning and reading a ton of stuff. And I thought, why, why doesn't this exist uh, for countries or world news or, or data that, you know, that matters? So um, started in my classroom. We, students draft countries. And then those countries now score points based on how many times they're mentioned in the news and then the tone of that news. So it, it, uh, it puts it on like a uh, collaboration conflict scale. So they score positive points if the country's doing something positive in the world and negative points if, if they're doing something negative in the world. Oh, okay. I didn't quite understand that. It's the gold, like Goldman tone, right? Was what it was called? Yeah, gold, Goldstein it's called. So okay. this, this professor came up with a scale, 10 okay. to negative 10, and that's got like different levels of, you know, depending on what's happening there. Military sanctions, you know, are, are scored pretty positively, but, but not that high. Um, positive collaboration in terms of like economic aid scores positively, but um, he's, he's sort of come up with a scale that, that ranks it on a number 10 to negative 10. Great. And what are some other uses? Because I, I know I've seen just via Twitter that it seems like teachers use this different ways in their classroom. Yeah. For the sure, yeah. common ways people use it in their classroom. Yeah, so so I sort of designed it to use it however I want, right? I wanted students to engage in in my existing content, and I also wanted them to engage with news. And so uh, we've set it up so teachers can use it whatever whatever they want to do with it in their classroom. So we're seeing a lot of. Um, a lot of different ways. So one of the ways is uh, geography teachers will sort of use it to um, study each continent. So they'll only draft countries from each continent, uh, which is pretty cool, something I never did with it. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, history teachers. This is something I did. A lot of history teachers will use it, um, for instance, to draft Cold War countries. And so they'll sort of look at the news happening in, in only those Cold War countries and then um, sort of see the legacy of the Cold War uh, one of the coolest things I've seen done with it is uh, teachers will play low score wins. And the, uh, the idea here is to, so uh, they told me that their students were like, why isn't Africa in the news? And they, they figured out, you know, that um, countries in Africa aren't in the news much. And so they thought, let's play low score wins and see what happens. And so it turned out to be those, those countries that aren't in the news much, uh, which are a lot of countries in Africa, not that there's, you know, not that there's anything important happening to them, right? Yeah. Um, but low score wins, and then you know they'll 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 run it for uh, different lengths of time depending on what's happening in their classes. You know, around a unit, or I used to run it around the Winter Olympics, for instance, um, or the Summer Olympics outside of class. So there's all sorts of really really cool use cases that are happening, but um, we try to design it so that teachers can use it however they want. So in general, like obviously you're bringing games into your classroom to engage students. Is, what is gaming in your classroom? What should it look like in any classroom? Yeah, so 
Um, I, I wouldn't consider what we do gamification. Okay. Um, so, I, I mean, right, you, you could say it is it is a game, obviously, but but I like to think of it as the learnification of gaming. Um, so, so we've taken this this sort of real, authentic, very popular thing called fantasy sports and sort of used it to learn more. Um, and so, I I wasn't like gamifying. Um, my classroom or I wasn't gamifying assignments that sort of happens but I, but I was going after um, a game that already exists and how can we learn from it um, so it's a lot like uh, Minecraft has gotten very popular you know something that already existed how can you learn from that in the classroom um, Angry Birds right is, is sort of an example of a, a very popular game that teachers um, kind of use to do this um, so so I, I think of it that way as more of a, you're learning from a game, a uh, game that's become very popular, rather than trying to gamify and, and um, you know, sort of add it on top of your content. So you see it as something that teachers would use just for a short period of time just to teach a certain lesson or multiple times a year to teach certain lessons versus doing it the entire year in your example. Yeah, I don't, I don't see a lot of teachers using it for nine months straight. I see them using it uh, for short periods of time for, for a long time. So we've allowed teachers to reset scores and, and duplicate leagues. Um, so when you think about like the fantasy football season, right, it goes all season, you got to get in, and then you, you go for 16 or 17 weeks. That's not necessarily the case with fantasy geopolitics. Uh, usually it's uh, anywhere from two weeks to two months, mm. and then they sort of do different things with it after that period. What what do you see as the most positive thing about fantasy and politics for like, students? What do you see as most positive? Yeah, so like an intrinsic habit creating uh, with reading news, uh, which which um, research in fantasy sports. I, I found out after I sort of started this in my classroom. Research in fantasy sports says that um, this thing called competitive fandom starts. Uh, and this comes out of the University of Wisconsin, but that it, when you draft a team of baseball players, when you draft a team of football players, you sort of automatically become more aware of those players and what they're doing and what's happening on their teams. And, and so the same thing happens with, with fantasy geopolitics. Even if a teacher does nothing else with it in the classroom, um, I always describe it as like a, you, you're wearing an Ohio State shirt, so you're going to notice more people with Ohio State shirts on, especially if that's red. The same thing happens when you draft a team of countries. You hear more about those countries in the news. Um, if your parents have the news on at home, you all, all of a sudden tune into that news right on the radio, as well as um, some sort of daily habits related to going to that news or, or having it come to you and sort of be, becoming more aware of what's happening in the world. Gotcha. Okay, that's great. What is something to watch out for, I think, when you're trying to do a game in your classroom or gaming or whatever? What's something to be aware of so it doesn't kind of go off the rails? Yeah. So, yeah, I really like the – I think Maya Angelou said this. She said, uh, nothing works unless you do. Um, I think I think sometimes, you know, it, whether it's ed, education technology or like any any game, um, sometimes we sort of use those things and think this is going to solve all of my problems. I'm just going to, you know, give it to students and, and then I'm going to back off and say, go, you know, and they're going to get everything from it. I, I don't think that's the case with anything. Um, I think it, the, the more a teacher sort of understands how it works and then um, prepares students, especially before a draft. The more competitive it is, the more fun it is, and the more learning happens. Um, so, so you know, I don't want to, I don't want to like deceive anybody and say yeah. uh, this. This is the solution to all your problems, sure. uh, because because I think um, you know, with with a little effort and a little work and a little design, um, it can it can do some really cool things in your classroom. Cool. Uh, as, an, as a teacher, what would you say is the first step of – so I take it you created something probably was like a spreadsheet at first, right? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, it was, it was a Google site. Yeah, you could still, you could still see it on the internet. It's, it's pretty, uh, pretty gross. Yeah, so the, that kind of obviously became something much greater that yep. others could use. Yep. How would – if a teacher has an idea like you had, how would you recommend they start 
even just implementing it in their own classroom and then also throughout their whole school maybe, you know, or yeah. bigger. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say just start, right? There are all sorts of books written by Harvard professors and that's, that are titled Just Start. Um, and I, I literally did that in my classroom. I was, I was frustrated. Uh, you know, I distracted myself with, with mm -hmm. fantasy football, realized I was doing all this learning. And then, to be totally honest, right, sort of didn't have a lesson plan for the next day. Mm -hmm. And so I laid in bed that night thinking, I wonder if I could do this in my classroom. Um, so we took the next period, the next class period, and we uh, just drafted countries. And it turned out to be a super fun learning experience. And so then after that, I, I designed ways to sort of learn more from it. And so my advice would be, if you, if you have an idea, you know, the classroom, I think, is a great place to experiment. And if it's not, it's probably not the most enjoyable place. Um, so if, if you're not enjoying it, um, try an experiment. And, and every experiment I did in my classroom turned out to be one of the most enjoyable um, times. And then as the, the game evolved, you know, I was honest with students. I, I came in the next day and I said like, hey, I'm trying to trick you into reading. Uh, you, guys, <laughs> you guys, you know, only engage with the most interesting sources for like 30 seconds. Uh, your your attention span is like less than a goldfish. And, and everybody laughs because we've sort of created this rapport. But I was honest with them. I was like, we're going to do this experiment, see if it works. Yeah. And, and over time, it did. You know, like um, when I started it, not everybody was like super into it. And I figured out ways to do that. Uh, I'll never forget one kid after our first sort of draft one kid, I was, I asked him, I was like, are you guys learning anything from this? And, and one kid raised his hand and he was like, it's, it's kind of whack. And he said, you know, it's yeah. like the 19, 1980s, 1990s. Uh, so, <laughs> so I was like, what do you mean by that? And he was like, well, it just, it just seemed like a lot of fun, but, but I learned something about Somalia piracy today. I learned something about Djibouti, which is a funny name. And I just didn't know there was stuff happening there. And so I thought, oh, okay, maybe there's maybe there's something to this. And so, uh, you know, over the course of semesters and drafts and, and years, I sort of just iterated on it, and I did it with students. And so I always like to think about my students as my co-founders. And, and so, um, yeah, it costs some money, right? So <laughs> I figured out after, after testing that, um, I needed to design a website and sort of put out a what, what's called a minimum viable product for other people to use and then keep iterating on that. So it was it was little bets. So I was, I was sort of betting the garden rather than the farm, as they say. And, uh, and now I'm at a point where where I can sort of keep doing that. Right. It's not like it's not like I've won the lottery or anything. Um, it's a ton of hard work. But I think starting experimenting. Um, understanding your assumptions and then iterating on those assumptions is is a great way to do anything, especially in education. And how do you reach students that aren't super competitive? So, for example, like we did, we played my office with one of like the free accounts, and and we did a draft, and it was it was fun. Like, and we were like we got into it. And then one of us just ran away with it. Yeah, he, he like drafted very Middle Eastern and, and very smart. Yep. And um, and so we were trying to like gang up on him to try to just overtake him. Like yeah. everyone traded me their best countries for my yeah. works, you know. Still couldn't <laughs> catch him, you know. But so we took it very seriously because yeah. you know it's a small group of people. But what about those students that just aren't very competitive, you know, in nature? Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do a lot of teachers or you kind of engage them as well? Yeah, so so this this will often happen, right? Uh, students who are most aware will will often draft really well, and then the students who aren't really aware and draft like Djibouti because it sounds funny um, just get crushed, right? And so um, one of the things that I did in my classroom was like use this as an example of real life stuff, right? The more you're aware, the more you're prepared the more you're gonna compete better, and the more you're probably gonna become successful. And I know that's not how 
always how it works, but the, the game at the very least provide, provided like a more fun, um, sort of efficient and simpler way to get at that life skill. <laughs> and also like a lot of teachers who, who don't really know how to set up a draft well, um, which, which is the case a lot, sort of realize pretty quick that that will happen and sort of reset scores or, or have another draft, you know, a few weeks afterward. And then they sort of figure it out and think like, how can I prepare students to make this as competitive as possible? And then it gets really fun, right? So the, the first time is I always tell teachers like, it's probably going to fail, right? This is an experiment. Have some fun with it. Just be aware that this is probably going to happen and then use it in your next draft to do a little bit better. Um, I, I always had this problem in my classroom, even when I was like a pro with it. So I called them like the, the bottom fifth, right? I didn't like tell this to their face. We weren't talking about like grades or anything, but there was always like a, a small group of students who would get crushed yeah. um, because they were, you know, drafted countries that nobody knew about. And I, I eventually sort of just said like, hey, you guys always get smoked in this game. Like, are you learning anything? Like, are you getting anything out of it? And, and I'll never forget, like, one of my most disengaged students said, like, like yeah, it's, it's really hard for me to, to win. But he's like, he said, I get why I'm losing, and I know how to pronounce Kiribas, uh, which, is, which I never would have known about. And I sort of learned a little bit about that country. And, and, and they, they always tell me like they enjoy the class experience even when they're losing. And no matter what happens, they always learn a little bit more. Um, so I, I started in my classroom and then, and then we're sort of building on this stuff, um, giving students in the bottom ways to sort of get their score up. So I don't know if you noticed when you were playing, teachers can adjust their scores or like add or subtract points. Um, so we started doing some, for instance, the first five minutes of class, it was like show the fantasy scores. And then we did like a geography challenge. And so it was very lightweight little stuff to sort of have someone in the bottom, challenge somebody at the top and then get more points or, or lose points from the top. And so we, you know, experimented with that stuff, but teachers are doing um, all sorts of things to sort of keep that bottom fifth competing better. They're still learning, but just competing better uh, in the game. So as, as you said, like you, you have this setup, this website, right? And it, and it's paid because it, takes money to do what you're doing right yep. you need to eat and stuff yep. um, and so how do you often te do teachers tell you how they pay for it do they often pay for it out of pocket do they often get their administrators to pay for it? do you have any suggestions for people it's like oh I want to try this yeah yeah so, yeah so I mean we, we can see that data so I know as a as especially a charter school teacher how big of a pain um, getting my school to pay for something is, which is super unfortunate, right? And that's changing. I get, you know, it's it's hard for tech directors and tech coordinators and, and school purchasers to sort of make everybody happy. Um, but but we're trying to take the the PO process that exists at a lot of schools and make it really simple for teachers. Um, so, for instance, I know a teacher is willing to pay like thirty to thirty five dollars out of pocket for anything. I also know that 70% of our teachers have a discretionary budget under $100. And I also know that like nothing's ever free. <laughs> um, so the, the first thing I, I would, would do is encourage um, anyone using anything to um, sort of understand that if, if you want something to be decent, you have to pay for it. And that even if uh, something's free, uh, I, I use Schoology for free at my school, loved it. Um, but they were trying to figure out ways to make money, right? This, <laughs> it just doesn't work without it. And yeah. so I would, I would encourage teachers, because I always did this too, I tried to use everything as cheaply as possible, get stuff for free. Um, I would encourage them, if you think this is a good idea, right, to get over that hump. But we're seeing that a lot of our teachers through our payment process are um, – having their schools pay for it pretty easily. And so a lot of our teachers are sending digital requisitions to their schools. Their schools are, are paying for it with a, you know, a credit card or a check or a PO. And it's sort of getting the teacher access while 
having the school pay for it. And so we're working on that over and over again um, to sort of iterate. But uh, but I you know I know the 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 pay is a uh, barrier for teachers, but we've also sort of given them a way to. Uh, check it out with their teacher friends for free or with a few students or you know a lot of teachers figure out on their own and, and I often just tell them like you can enter a team on that player line too right so take a class of 25 and enter them as uh, five teams and, and just play and check it out and if you like it pay for it um, so so yeah I mean it it doesn't work unless less people validate it and pay for it and then the more that comes in right I'm not I'm taking every cent I have right now and reinvesting it into the game because this is something I believe in as a, as a platform. Um, but we've got a, a very, very long list of stuff that we want to do yet. <laughs> and we add to that sort of daily as we iterate on the game. I'm sure. That's great. Thank you so much for your time. Um, it's really interesting to hear about your process and how that, how that happened. But it's a cool product too. I wish I... Um, had a classroom to do it with even even though I was a math teacher <laughs> yeah well we're, we're getting there like I said we're you know the US edition will come out uh, next year and then hopefully by by uh, this time next year any any content area teacher will be able to sort of use the same model to to engage in their content so all right well thank you very much